back and look at them later. Who's read this book? Daniel. Oh, this is one of the best books you'll ever read. Way ahead of its time. He published this in 2006, okay, about the right brain. And 2016, we're seeing a lot of what he said now. It's like, oh my gosh, he was exactly right. And he's only going to get more right, no pun intended, as we go along. So there are five different clips that he talks about. The first, he differenti differentiates the difference between the right brain and the left brain. Okay? Talks about the left brain as being the analytical side detail side, the, the algorithmic side, right? The left brain people where that used to be the way that farmers were largely algorithmic, um, engineers largely algorithmic, math often thought of as algorithmic. You do this step, then this step, then this step, and you get this result. That's the way, the way it was. The left brain makes paintbrushes. We figured out the process to put the wood wire, or whatever, they figured out the process to do that, how to make that mechanical, how to move that along in a swift fashion to get more out to make more money. Left brain people have done that. Then he talks about the right brain. The right brain is in charge of the artistic side. The right brain is in charge of creativity. The right brain is in charge of the aesthetics. Okay? So whereas the left brain makes paintbrushes, the right brain uses them. The right brain will take the paintbrush and make art out of it. So he says the right brainers are going to be in more demand than left brainers. And we'll talk about why that is right now. Clip number two. Now earlier Wanda and Lolly were talking about things you bought at Target, right? In the past, you had to go to fancy department stores, right, to find quality items. Is that correct? If you go to Walmart, you get cheap stuff. Have you been to Walmart lately to buy clothes or whatever? The, their selection is a lot better than it used to be. I bought this shirt at Walmart, for example. It used to be you wouldn't even, because the, the quality wasn't there. You know? We live now in an age of abundance, for the most part, where you can go to Target and buy something nice. You don't have to go to Saks Fifth Avenue to buy something nice. When I say nice, I mean, he talks about a designer toilet brush. And in his clip, he actually holds up the toilet brush, asks the audience, what's this? Toilet brush. What kind of toilet brush? It's a designer toilet brush. Right? And it was designed by, some, I can't remember, guy's name is some designer who does furniture and all that kind of stuff. He's like, I can sell this to Target, right? I can add some flair to it. People are going to buy it. Why are they going to buy it? Because of the designer. He says, there have been no major advancements in toilet brush technology. <laughs> really. Uh, yeah. The only difference now is that you have some designer who can slap his name on there charge 15 bucks for a toilet brush. It adds significance to something that is made for the utility. It's going to clean the toilet the same way. But you feel more elegant when you do it. Yes, I don't know. So he talks about, we live in this age of abundance. So why do you buy that toilet brush over the one that costs 99 cents? Quality might be a little better. He talks about a toaster in the video. A toaster. You go to the store to buy a toaster. How many options of toasters do you have? Too many, right? They all do the same thing. Maybe one has more slots, whatever, but you look for utility, you also look for significance. Your significance is which color matches my decor better? Which one matches my fridge? Which one is going to go up the dishwasher, so on and so forth, right? Clip number three talks about routine. Have you been to a McDonald's lately? Good. But if you have, you know, and a lot of other stores are doing the same thing, they have kiosks now where you can go up to them and punch in your order, and then you wait, the order goes back, and then they call it your number, you grab your food, you're good. You don't have to talk face to face with the 16 year old kid who can't, can't change, right? 
he says, Daniel Payne says, the most dangerous word that we're going to come across is routine. If your job involves routine, you're in danger of losing it. So think about the jobs that have been shipped overseas. Think about the jobs that have been lost to computers. And think about the jobs that no longer hold significance. Most of them have to do with routine. So we balance kiosks, other things like that. The computer can take over that job. Have you ever called customer service to, I don't know, some place? And you get someone who can't speak English very well? Do you know why they can't speak English very well? They don't live here! They live in Singapore. You just called Singapore. You called the number and got shipped over there. You have someone in Singapore, because they work for cheaper. Okay? India, they all work for cheaper in India, Singapore, those kind of places than they do in the United States. So if your job involves routine, answering the phone, following the script, did you try this, did you try that, let me get you to someone else who might know, then maybe the call goes back to someone. Um, clip 4 talks about three questions to answer, and it comes down to is my job still relevant? We talked about those already. Can someone overseas do it cheaper? Can it, it be done faster by a computer? 